With the arrival of the pilgrims here on the shores of what would become known as the United States of America, the focus of the Protestant Reformation and its call for a return to the Bible as the Christian's supreme authority began to shift from the old world to the new. Thousands braved the often treacherous journey across the Atlantic Ocean during the 17th and 18th centuries in search of a refuge for freedom. In Europe, even in England, the pendulum of power swung back and forth for decades between those who wanted to protect religious freedom and those who wanted to curtail it. More and more, it was recognized that a new country with a new philosophy of government would be needed as a haven for those wishing to hold and share their faith in accord with the dictates of conscience. With America's achievement of independence from Great Britain in 1783, a series of events opened the way for an even clearer understanding of the Bible, and in particular, Bible prophecy. The French Revolution, which began in 1789, saw the people of France rise up against not only the monarchy, but also the church. There was an attempt to overthrow the Bible and Christianity altogether. The cry of the revolutionaries was, crush the wretch. And the wretch that they were referring to was Jesus. The Bible had been rejected, neglected, ignored so long. The principles of the Protestant Reformation had been rejected by a church that was unwilling to be reformed. France's brief experiment with atheism instead of getting rid of the Bible or the message of Christianity, led more people than ever before to be interested in God's Word. In the early years of the 19th century, Bible societies sprang up around the world. Interest spread in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. The way would be opened for yet another reformer, this one from the United States, to call the attention of the world to the Word of God. That man was William Miller. He was born in 1782, the same year as Martin Van Buren, who would become the eighth president of the United States. When Miller was born in Pittsfield in Western Massachusetts, the Revolutionary War was in full swing. George Washington became the nation's first president just days before William Miller's seventh birthday. Like so many other reformers, poverty and hardship shaped his character. His father had served as a captain in the Continental Army during the American Revolution. Many of his father's struggles and trials made a big impression on young William. His mother was a woman of integrity with deep religious convictions. Miller was a strong young man and he was intelligent. He wasn't able to attend college, pretty typical for people of his era, but he did enjoy books and he learned a lot from his own studies. He was raised a Baptist. But in his early 20s, he began to read the writings of Thomas Paine and Voltaire and Ethan Allen, and he became a deist. He believed in God, but he didn't believe that God intervened directly in the lives of human beings. But that view would be challenged. While serving in the military, a bomb exploded just two feet from where he was standing. Three of his men were injured. One was killed but Miller miraculously escaped unscathed. Add to that the improbable victory over the British, and Miller began to wonder whether or not God had something to do with that. After his time in the military, William Miller moved here to this farm near the Adirondack Mountains, just outside of Whitehall in eastern New York, close to the border with Vermont. Farm life wasn't easy in the early 1800s. There was no mechanized farm equipment, no central heat in the home, William and his wife Lucy and their five children would have to survive off what the farm produced. And back at home, Miller opened the Bible for the first time in his life to learn for himself what the scriptures actually taught. It wasn't long before he met Jesus. Later, he wrote of this experience. I saw that the Bible did bring to view such a Savior as I needed, and I was perplexed to find how an uninspired book should develop principles so perfectly adapted to the wants of a fallen world. I was constrained to admit 
that the Scriptures must be a revelation from God. They became my delight, and in Jesus I found a friend. I lost all taste for other reading and applied my heart to get wisdom from God. The more he read and studied the Bible, the more fascinating it became to him. Now, he was an independent thinker, William Miller, and he rejected a number of the commonly held beliefs of his day. He didn't believe that the whole world would be converted to Christ, nor did he believe there'd be a thousand years of peace on earth. Now, Miller believed that the return of Jesus would be personal and literal, and that God would not set up his kingdom on earth until after Christ's return. He came to the conclusion that all of Scripture should be considered before reaching a conclusion about any Bible teaching. As the Apostle Paul wrote, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 he believed the Bible to be truly the Word of God, not just a collection of personal religious opinions. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Miller believed that the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and therefore comparing one passage of the Bible with another would lead you to a correct understanding. It was these principles for interpreting the Bible that led William Miller to shake up the world, especially when it came to Bible prophecy. Miller believed that by carefully studying the prophetic symbols in the Bible, he could arrive at a correct understanding of what those symbols represented. I'll be right back with more. It's undoubtedly the world's great superpower, the United States of America. But what of its role in Earth's last days? Does Bible prophecy speak of the United States of America? Find out by receiving our free gift, The United States in Bible Prophecy. Call us on 800-253-3000 or visit us online at itiswritten.com. Or you can write to the address on your screen. I'd like you to receive our free offer, The United States in Bible Prophecy. Thanks for joining me on It Is Written. William Miller was a Baptist farmer who studied his Bible, and he arrived at conclusions that shook up the United States of America. As he read the Bible, he was tempted to ignore the time periods found in Bible prophecy. But the more he read, the more convicted he became that these were periods that he really needed to understand. And the one to which his mind kept returning was Daniel 8 verse 14, which says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. As he tried to understand this verse, Miller followed the principle that the Bible is to be its own interpreter. He discovered from a reading elsewhere in the Bible that a day in Bible prophecy represents a year. He found that in Numbers 14 verse 34, Ezekiel 4, 6, and other places. And when he went over to Daniel chapter 9 and he read the 70 weeks prophecy that references Jesus' first coming, Miller was amazed by what he found. Here's that prophecy. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now that's quite a passage, and Miller 
was determined to get to the bottom of it. Consider what the passage contains, a time period allotted to Israel, 70 weeks, a commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the coming of Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus, His first coming, Messiah being cut off or executed, a covenant being confirmed for a week, the end of sacrifice and offering, and more. The popular theory in Miller's day was that the sanctuary referenced in Daniel 8.14 represented the earth. So Miller decided that the cleansing of the sanctuary would be when the earth was cleansed by fire when Jesus returned. And then there was this time period, 2,300 days, using the principle of prophetic interpretation that taught that a day represents a year in prophecy, Miller considered these 2,300 days to be 2,300 years. The decree that provided the starting point for this prophecy, Miller found in Ezra chapter 7, the decree issued by the Medo-Persian king Artaxerxes, permitting Israel to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and reorder society there. Knowing this, it wouldn't be hard for Miller to work out the particulars of this prophecy. So here's what Miller discovered. The decree was issued in the year 457 BC. Add 2,300 years to that, and you get to the year 1843. Miller was thrilled. He'd figured out that Jesus was going to return to the earth in just 25 years. Miller wrote, I was thus brought to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time, 1818, all the affairs of our present state would be wound up. The farmer, the former military man, had made an astonishing discovery. Jesus was coming back to the earth, and he knew when. He described the experience in these words. I need not speak of the joy that filled my heart in view of the delightful prospect nor of the ardent longings of my soul for a participation in the joys of the redeemed. The Bible was now to me a new book. It was indeed a feast of reason. All that was dark, mystical, or obscure to me in its teachings had been dissipated in my mind before the clear light that now dawned from its sacred pages. And oh, how bright and glorious the truth appeared! And then came the conviction that he should tell others what he'd learned. An inner voice seemed to drive him to go and tell it to the world. He shared his views in private studies and in conversations with others, but he wasn't in any hurry at all to make them known publicly. After all, he was no public speaker. He was 50 years old and had no formal theological training. For nine years, he resisted the commission that God was pressing upon his heart. Finally, he put God to the test. He told God in prayer that if he received an invitation to speak, he would take this as heaven's sign that he was to share his findings. As it happened, an invitation was on its way to him at that very moment. A young man had traveled 16 miles to the Miller farm with a message from his father in Dresden, New York. There wouldn't be any preaching in their church the next day. Instead, they wanted William Miller to talk to the people on the subject of the second coming of Jesus. Miller was shocked and angry that he'd made that promise to God. But he didn't give the boy an answer. Instead, he left his house and he came here to this very grove of trees where he spent about an hour talking with God, trying to get out of the commitment that he just made. But Miller couldn't break his covenant. Instead, he went back to the house where the boy was still waiting, and they later journeyed together to Dresden, a journey which took them about an hour, which means the boy had left his home to come and invite Miller to speak before Miller had made his pledge to God. It was later said that Miller came into the woods a farmer, and he went out a preacher. That presentation was so well received, he was asked to stay in Dresden and preach throughout the week. When he returned home, there was a letter inviting him to speak in Poultney, Vermont. And so it went. 
Over the next 13 years, William Miller would average almost 270 speaking appointments a year. While the common people received Miller's message enthusiastically, the popular religious leaders weren't impressed at all. Most of what they wrote, preached, or published about Miller's message was negative. In fact, the time came when many who accepted the teachings of Miller and his associates would be thrown out of many of the mainline churches. But like Martin Luther and other reformers, William Miller simply challenged his critics to show him his error from the Bible. The thing was, when people listened to what Miller said and then looked into the Bible, everything seemed to add up. It appeared that Miller was right. The 2,300 days were definitely 2,300 years. Miller had made that clear. The decree, Ezra chapter 7, made that clear. 457 BC. After that, simply a question of math. Daniel 8.14 had said, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What else could it mean? Jesus was coming back. And he was coming back in 1843. Except for one small thing. I'll be right back with more. In Matthew 4.4, the Word of God says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed especially for busy people like you. Look for Every Word on selected networks or watch it online every day on our website, itiswritten.com. Receive a daily spiritual boost. Watch Every Word. You'll be glad you did. Abbott and Costello, Jordan and Pippin, Wilbur Wright and Orville Wright, Simon and Garfunkel. Now, pardon my somewhat trivial examples here, but the point is one that you know well. Often, someone is prominent or achieves in large part because of the help of another person. The Protestant Reformation was the most significant religious and you could say political event of the last thousand years. And while we think of Martin Luther as the architect of the Reformation, Luther likely wouldn't have been Luther without Philip Melanchthon. Melanchthon was a giant intellect, a theologian, and he collaborated with Luther. He made Luther better, like Aaron and Hur holding up Moses' hands. Exodus 17 verse 12 says, And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side. Whose hands can you hold up today? God might be looking to you to bring out the best in someone else. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Let's live today by every word. Thanks for joining me on It Is Written. William Miller, a Baptist farmer from a small town in New York State, had discovered an amazing message in the Bible. His careful study of God's Word had proven that Jesus was coming back to the earth in 1843. But as you know, Jesus didn't come back in 1843. Well, after that massive disappointment, somebody figured out why. You see, they'd forgotten that there was no year zero. If you start at minus five and you count to plus five, that's a difference of 10. But if you start at 5 BC and you go to 5 AD, that's a difference of nine because there's no year zero. You go from 1 BC to 1 AD. Of course, Jesus wasn't coming back in 1843. He was coming back in 1844. Miller's followers were called Millerites and Adventists because of their belief in the imminent advent of Jesus. By the summer of 1844, this Advent movement built to its climax. In August, a man by the name of Samuel Snow addressed a Millerite gathering and showed from his study of Scripture and the ancient Jewish Day of Atonement that the tenth day of the seventh month the annual Day of Atonement, would fall in 1844 on the 22nd of October. This prediction gave even stronger momentum to the movement. The preachers continued to preach, and literature explaining the prophecies of the Bible and the time periods in question was circulated far and wide. One of the prominent leaders of the movement, Charles Fitch, died of pneumonia after baptizing believers in the Ohio River. 
Even though the weather was severely cold, he refused to turn anyone away. He died just 10 days before Jesus was expected to return. But his family didn't mourn. They believed that they'd be seeing him again, that his body would come up out of the grave in just a few more days. At last, the appointed day arrived. Some believers left their crops unharvested. One shop owner in Philadelphia left a sign in his window that said, This shop is closed in honor of the King of Kings, who will appear the 22nd of October. Get ready, friends, to crown him Lord of all. But as the day got longer, these faithful believers realized that Jesus might not return. When midnight arrived, the disappointment of the Millerites was intense. The prophecy found in Revelation chapter 10 was fulfilled. And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Revelation 10, 9 and 10. Descendants of people who lived here at the time say that some Millerite believers gathered right here on what today is known as Ascension Rock and waited here for Jesus to come. If that's true, their journey home that night would have been very difficult. Imagine believing that you were going to farewell your friends and neighbors. You'd never see them again, many of whom had ridiculed you for believing that Jesus was going to come back. Now you'd have to face them. They'd mock you again because you are here on this earth at all. Imagine believing that you were going to go to heaven and then discovering that heaven would have to wait. And of course, all of this begs some difficult questions. So how could William Miller, a faithful Baptist preacher, possibly get it so wrong? After all, the Bible says that no one knows the day or the hour of Jesus' return. Well, it's good to remember that William Miller himself never set a date, but one of his followers did circle a day on the calendar. Well, keep this in mind. Even Jesus' followers sometimes made mistakes. Jesus told them as plainly as he could that he was going to die, and they just couldn't understand what he was saying. When Jesus died, their hopes died with him. But out of that brutal disappointment, Jesus brought great things. And he brought good things out of the Millerite disappointment too. If Miller could be so wrong about something so basic, didn't that make him a deceiver, a false messiah? Well, no. No more than the followers of Jesus were false prophets. Miller was just wrong about a key point. Could Miller's error have jeopardized the faith of his followers? Well, that's possible, but this is a reminder to us that a person's faith must be individual, personal, based on the Bible, and not on the say-so of another human being. God achieved some great things through William Miller. Thousands of people were directed to the study of the Bible, in particular, the Bible's teaching about the second coming of Jesus. The second coming was a neglected teaching in Christianity, and Miller shone a spotlight on the Bible's teaching that Jesus was indeed soon to return to this earth. Today, that teaching is widely believed. Few in Christianity are not Adventists. Most Christians today believe in the advent of Jesus, and many believe it will happen soon. For that, William Miller is largely to credit. Revelation 10, which speaks of the bitter disappointment, goes on to say, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Revelation 10, verse 11. And since Miller's time, the church has been prophesying again. The news has gone to the world that Jesus is coming back soon, that everybody can be ready for that day through faith in Jesus Christ, and that the Bible is the rule of faith and practice for all believers. William Miller continued to preach, he continued to believe, and he continued to trust in God. He died in 1849 at the age of 67, and he's buried right here. Soon, the Protestant Reformation will be completed. 
Soon the words of Jesus will be fulfilled, those words spoken in Matthew 24, verse 14, when Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written, inviting you to join me for 500. Nine programs produced by It Is Written, taking you deep into the Reformation. This is the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. We'll take you to Wittenberg, and to Belgium, to England, to Ireland, to Rome, to the Vatican City, and introduce you to the people who created the Reformation, who pushed the Reformation forward. We'll take you to sites all throughout Europe where the Reformers lived and in some cases died. We'll bring you back to the United States and take you to a little farm in upstate New York and show you how God spread the Reformation here. Don't miss 500. You can own the 500 series on DVD. Call us on 888-664-5573 or visit us online at itiswritten.shop. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you've raised up men and women of faith to inspire us, to guide us, to urge us forward. We thank you that in spite of the failings of some, in spite of their foibles or mistakes, you still work. We thank you that you raised up William Miller to call us to the great truth that Jesus is coming again soon. Grant that we'd be ready for that day through faith in Jesus. Live your life in us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and let our lives be filled with the joy of knowing that one day soon, we will be with you forever. We pray with John who wrote Revelation when he said, even so, come Lord Jesus. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm looking forward to seeing you again next time. Until then, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.